worship you. How I praise your name. My desire is to honor you, Lord. And it is my prayer that you would take this time seriously, realizing that this is the inspired word of God. This comes right from the mouth of God, and so we want to study his word. So whatever may have happened these past few days, and whatever things are happening for the last few months or whatever, things that have not been resolved, I want you to put all those things aside because right now your focus ought to be, here I am, Lord, speak to my heart. I am all ears, speak to me. I want you to pay attention. It is no accident. It is not an accident that you are here. God intended for you to be here. He has a special purpose. He is going to use you and you and you to change the world. God is using you. He's equipping you. And there is no way, no shortcut to becoming that person God desires than to studying his word and being equipped from his word. I am determined I am committed in proclaiming, preaching from the Word of God as long as I can. As He would allow me, I would do so from His Word. Tonight's title is Deliverance and Joy. Deliverance and Joy. His Deliverance. Deliverance and Joy. God is faithful. The Bible is so clear on this. God is faithful faithful. There are many, many passages, but I am only going to give you two verses tonight, to your surprise. Second Timothy chapter 2, verse 13, we read, if we are faithless, he remains faithful, for he cannot deny himself. He cannot go against his character. He cannot go against who he is. He is faithful. He cannot be unfaithful even if he wanted to. He cannot deny himself. He cannot go against who he is. He is faithful even though we are so unfaithful. 1 Peter chapter 4, verse 19 says, Therefore let those who suffer according to God's will entrust their souls to a faithful creator while doing good. Those of us who are suffering, it may be because of our sin. Some of us suffer because of wrong accusation. Some of us are persecuted, rightfully so. A lot of times we are going through what we're going through because of our sinfulness. But sometimes we are wrongfully judged. We are wrongfully miscategorized. A lot of times we are the victim in certain cases. However, we are told that those who suffer according to God's will entrust their souls to a faithful creator while doing good. Let go of all of your situation. Let God handle the result. You just simply continue doing good is what we are told to do. Are you going through some hard time these days? Are you going through some terrible situation in your life which is unfair, unjust, Continue doing good. At the proper right time, he is going to lift you up. God hears. God sees. God understands. He knows. I am so glad that we have a God who knows all things. We do not need to retaliate. We do not need to fight back. We do not need to give excuses. We simply continue doing good. And at the proper right time, he is going to see to it that all these things will be made right. To that I say a loud, resounding amen, because we have a God who knows all things. He knows our past, he knows our present, and he certainly knows the future. He knows the future, where we will be, how we will turn out, how your children, your grandchildren, future children will turn out. He knows all things. To him, time does not matter. He is outside time. He is outside time, matter, and space. He is above all that. That is why he is God. He knows all things, and that is why we worship him. He is someone worthy of our worship. We don't want to worship somebody that's below us. We want to worship someone that we cannot even touch, someone that is so high, so above us. We must bow down to worship, 
And that's who our God is. He is above all things. He is our creator. But he is faithful. And because of his faithfulness, we the believers have eternal security. We began to talk about this last week, last Wednesday. We are secured in Christ. Believers cannot lose his or her salvation because it is God, God is faithful, he's the one who started the salvation, he's the one who's maintaining that salvation, and he will carry us until the finish line. Amen. So Romans chapter 5, verses 1 through 11, has to do with believer's security, and we have mentioned that in verse 1, we have peace with God. That's reason number one why we know that our salvation is secure. It says, therefore, since we have been justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. We have peace with God. We used to be enemies with God. Now we have peace with God. That secures us of our salvation. Secondly, in verse 2, we have the grace. Through him, we have also obtained access by faith into this grace in which we stand. We are able to stand. We don't stumble. We don't fall because we have the grace of God. We are able to stand firmly. We can become bold. We have access because God's grace is with us. Our salvation is secure because of the peace, grace, and thirdly in verse 2, hope. And we rejoice in hope of the glory of God. We hope. What does this hope entail? It is talking about glorification. It is talking about our hope later on when our bodies will be glorified. Brothers and sisters, God did not justify us just so that we become saved. He justified us so that we will be glorified. That's the ultimate goal. He has justified us, meaning he has made us right. He has made us righteous So that when God the Father looks at us, he looks at us through the eyes of Jesus and those who have received Christ as Lord and Savior, we are saved, but he does not leave us there. The purpose for saving us is so that he would glorify us, our bodies to be glorified. And that's just so beautiful because, and logical too, I keep saying time after time after time that unless we are changed and glorified, we cannot be in the presence of a holy God. He is so holy and righteous, he has to change us. He has to transform us, so we are being changed every single day. Before we can get to the glorification, we have to go through what is called the sanctification, the process by which we become holy. That's what you and I, every one of us, every believer goes through this sanctification. And that is why we are told in John chapter 15, Jesus says, I am the vine, you are the branches, and that he will cut or prune those branches. Those branches that do not produce fruit will be cut off and they will be dried up and be burned away. But those branches that will bear fruit, we will be pruned. The word pruning is actually to be cleansed. So the father, the farmer, if you will, he is going to prune every branch, every child of God who is bearing fruit Our God is going to cut and clean and prune so that we will bear much fruit. And while that is taking place, the process of sanctification is very, very hurtful. That is why growing is painful. Those of you who have been Christians for a short period of time, a little longer, some have been Christians the whole lifetime, but it is not an easy process because there are growing pains physically, there are certainly growing pains spiritually. You are going through everything, not only what Satan throws at you, God the Father, because he wants you to become the person that he wants you to be, he is pruning you, he is disciplining you, he is chastising you, all for your benefit so that you will grow into the person that he desires you to be. He cuts away, number one, sin, obviously. He cuts away the sin, but sometimes there are things that are not what you call sin, but unfruitful behaviors. 
These areas, which is unnecessary, wasteful behavior, he cuts away those things. How does he do it? He does so through disappointments, your grief, by providing, sometimes allowing failure, hardship, loss of a job, loss of a loved one, persecution, reputation, sickness, slander. He cuts away, and every time you go through these things, because God the Father allows these things to take place, he is making you become holier, more righteous, and become a better person of God, thereby producing more fruit. If you have been a Christian any length of time, and you have not produced any fruit, there is a serious situation. Every child physically grows. Every spiritual child must grow, even if it's a small, gradual progress. If you're making any progress, gradual as it may be, you ought to be producing fruit because God desires you to grow. And that is why he cuts you. That's the hope we have. Before we can get to the glorification, the process of sanctification must take place. All of your afflictions, difficulties, and pain, they get us ready for the knife. When God prunes us, he uses a knife, and the knife, according to the word of God, is the very words of God. He uses the sword, the edge, the cutting, the edge, the knife is the word of God. So you can picture it this way. All the pain and affliction is the handle of the knife. It gets you ready for the cutting. It gets you ready. All the tribulation, persecution, pain, suffering, all of these things get you ready for when God cuts you. And so it gets you ready. So realize when things are happening in your life, don't say, why me? Why me again? Why me now? Rather, Thank you, Lord, for your desire to make me a better person of God. It's so very difficult when difficulties come. The best of us, we don't know how to handle it. Some people even leave their faith. But realize that God disciplines his own children. Listen to what Hebrews chapter 12 says. Verses 7 to 11 says, so powerful. Hebrews chapter 12, starting with verse 7. It is for discipline that you have to endure. God is treating you as sons, for what son is there whom his father does not discipline? If you are left without discipline, in which all have participated, then you are illegitimate children and not sons. Besides this, we have had earthly fathers who disciplined us, and we respected them. Shall we not much more be subject to the Father of spirits and live? For they disciplined us for a short time, as it has seemed best to them, but he disciplines us for our good, that we may share his holiness. For the moment, all discipline seems painful rather than pleasant, but later it yields the peaceful fruit of righteousness to those who have been trained by it. Amen. If you are being disciplined, it is because you belong to God. It is a proof. It is evidence that you are a child of God. Every child is disciplined by God because he wants to prune you. He wants to hone you. He wants to make you the person to be ready for his task. How can we go out into the world, be all nations? How can we be all things to all people? How can we do good damage for the kingdom of God? How can we go out and make people come into the kingdom of God unless we are pruned? And he does so by allowing these painful situations to take place. The next time, rather than asking question, are you even there, God? Can't you see that I'm dying, my tears? Can't you see that I'm suffering, I'm in pain? I want to tell you, our God sees all tears. No tear has ever been dropped to the ground without God personally scooping down and picking that up. He's actually saving all of your tears in a bottle. He is saving all of your griefs and sadness and loneliness and depression, all the heartaches that you've ever experienced 
God knows exactly what you're going through. That is why when the Israelites were crying out to God because of the slavery, because of the affliction they were under, they were crying out to God, and God says, I know, I have seen your misery. I have seen the pain and suffering. Brothers and sisters, you can be sure that our Heavenly Father knows your pain. He knows what you're going through. He knows what I'm going through. He knows everybody's needs. He knows exactly what you're going through, what your family's going through. He is the almighty, all-knowing God. Amen. How secure are we? I want you to know that the peace that the Bible is talking about is permanent. It is the peace that the world cannot give. Grace of God is permanent. Hope, permanent. All of these things are permanent. Your salvation, permanent. It is not a temporary state. Just because you felt good today and you said, Lord Jesus, you're my God, so today you're saved, but tomorrow some tragedy happens and you disown God, God does not therefore retaliate and say, oh yeah, you have let me go, I am also going to let you go. Salvation is secure. It is permanent. Love also is permanent in verse 5. Look at verse 5 of Romans 5. Poured into our hearts. It says, because God's love has been poured into our hearts through the Holy Spirit who has been given to us. The word Holy Spirit, by the way, has been officially introduced for the very first time in the book of Romans. And through the Holy Spirit who has been given to us, God's love has been poured into our hearts. The word poured means you can't seize it. You cannot make it your own. You cannot capture it. It is different unlike any human love. The love that God is talking about right now is different from any love the world can offer. Anytime a believer sins... It involves the indwelling Holy Spirit, the Holy Spirit who resides in every believer. Every time you sin, it involves the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit is God's guarantee. It is his down payment that one day you will be glorified. You see, we are saved, but we have not been consummated yet. We are still living. The reason that after your conversion, your salvation, the reason that God did not take you up right away after your conversion is that he has some purpose for you here in this world. But he is giving every believer a deposit, the Holy Spirit, because it is his down payment. He is saying, I am giving you the Holy Spirit, and later on, I'm going to come to redeem you, glorify you, and have you enter my kingdom. Salvation is permanent. It cannot be taken away. Peace, grace, hope, and love. And in verse 9, where we will be concentrating tonight, 9 through 11, your salvation is secure because of deliverance. Look at verse 9. Since therefore we have now been justified by his blood, much more shall we be saved by him from the wrath of God. Man, I don't know if you get this idea. We have been delivered from the wrath of God. If there's anything that I would desire most, yes, the peace of God is great. The grace of God is great. The hope of glory is great. The love of God which has been poured upon our hearts is great. But the wrath of God, I am exempt from the wrath of God. To me, that is so, so valuable, so important. It just is beyond words. Listen to this in Revelation chapter 20. Revelation 20, 11 through 14. Then I saw a great white throne, and him who was seated on it, from his presence earth and sky fled away, and no place was found for them. And I saw the dead, great and small, standing before the throne, and books were opened. Then another book was opened, which is the book of life, and the dead were judged by what was written in the books according to what they had done. 
and the sea gave up the dead who were in it. Death and Hades gave up the dead who were in them, and they were judged, each one of them, according to what they had done. Then death and Hades were thrown into the lake of fire. This is the second death, the lake of fire. And if anyone's name was not found written in the book of life, he was thrown into the lake of fire. We are saved from God's wrath. Those who will be going to hell will be weeping, they will be wailing, they will be gnashing their teeth, they will be in darkness, they would have isolation, they would be tortured from their guilt, there is no relief forever. And yet we, the believers, would be saved from all that. Praise be to God, we are saved from the wrath of God. No believer will be given the wrath of God. We are saved from the wrath of God. Our justification requires God's blood to be shed. That is why we trust the blood of Jesus Christ. It is his faithful offering which became the satisfactory substitute for us, the sinners. Substitutionary death. Jesus died pleasing the Father. It was adequate satisfactory substitution. No animals of the Old Testament was good enough. No animal sacrifice made it possible. God was not satisfied. It was just not enough, not good enough. It is wonderful to have peace with God, as I said, grace endlessly, hope of glory, love that cannot die, but to be delivered from eternal wrath That's the pinnacle. That is the highest point of reward, that we would not be given the wrath of God. By the way, God never found anything in us that was good enough for that deliverance. There is nothing in us that's good enough for God to say, okay, I'm not going to give you the wrath. Even our best is mingled with sin. He saved us for his glory. In spite of us, he saved us. Not because of us. In spite of us, he saved us and promised to deliver us from his wrath. That's the good news. I, for one, would not be looking forward to meeting him if I know that he is going to judge me and give me his wrath, receive what I rightfully deserve. But thanks be to God, the grace of God means that I am going to receive what I do not deserve. He is going to give me something that I do not deserve. And that's eternal life. That is forgiveness. He is going to forgive me of all of my wrongdoing. Galatians chapter 3 says he became a curse for us. He became a curse for us. And in Ephesians chapter 2, verse 4 and 5, God being rich in mercy because of the great love with which he loved us even when we were dead in our trespasses. And in verse 10 we are told, for if while we were enemies we were reconciled to God by the death of his son, much more now that we are reconciled shall we be saved by his life. It is simply put, if he loved us when we were wretched, utterly undeserving and unworthy, There's no trouble now that we have become his friends. If God loved us when we were so wretched and so his enemy, before he still saved us, how much more after we became his friends? If Christ in death can save us, then a living Christ can keep us saved. That is why we cannot lose our salvation. If we were saved when we were sinners, and if his death saved us, how much more now that he's alive? If we can be saved when we were enemies, we can be secured now that we are his friends. And finally, the reason that our salvation is secured, not only is it because we have peace with God, we have his grace that we can able to stand, we have the hope of glory, We have the love that has been poured into our hearts. We have the deliverance from his wrath. In verse 11, we have joy. 
Verse 11 reads, More than that, we also rejoice in God through our Lord Jesus Christ, through whom we have now received reconciliation. From peace to grace to hope to love to deliverance and now joy, Paul the Apostle finally has reached the ultimate and he has been hinting and it has been brewing. There's more, there's more, there's more. And then in verse 11 it says, More than that! We also rejoice in God through our Lord Jesus Christ, through whom we have now received reconciliation. If there's one thing, one emotion, one attitude that should dominate the life of a Christian, if there's one attitude, if there's one emotion that should dominate a believer, it is joy. Joy. What else do you want if this doesn't bring you joy? If God has given you peace, grace, hope, love, deliverance, and joy, what more does God have to give for you to be joyful, rejoicing? There's nothing in this world that can offer this joyfulness. What else do you want if this doesn't bring you joy? Salvation is not merely a future. It is present joy, anticipation of that future. Salvation is not looking towards the future only. It is now, current, present, anticipating what the future will hold. So you must be joyful now. You must be joyful at this moment. And it marks, it is one of the most great markers of a child of God. When you see a person Joyful, rejoicing in the Lord under all circumstances, even though he might be down a second, but the next minute he or she is up again, rising, and the countenance is praising the Lord, thanking God, appreciating him, and instead of saying, why me, saying, I appreciate you for what you are doing, God, even though I may not understand everything, even though I am in pain, I know that you are pruning me, you are chastising me, disciplining me for my reason to sanctify me for the ultimate glorification, joy. Everything is much less wood, hay, stubble. Everything in the world compared to this, whether it be money, position, job, knowledge, whatever it is that this world can offer that you desire, is nothing in comparison. They are nothing but wood, hay, and stubble. The single greatest mark of spirituality, one single greatest mark of spirituality it's not love, it is not hope, it is joy. Joy. We don't get too much of that. And I'm not talking about silliness, the kind of slap happy attitude, the irresponsible mentality. I'm not talking about just easygoing attitude. I'm not talking about cracking a joke here or there. I'm talking about the long-lasting, deep-seated, settled joy that nothing in this world can move. Nothing in this world can move the joy that you have. That's the joy that God gives as a result of these things. We are certain these things are permanently given by God because God is faithful. He holds on to what he promises. He gives what he promises. He never fails. In Habakkuk chapter 3, verse 18, Yet I will rejoice in the Lord, I will take joy in the God of my salvation. Yet I will rejoice, no matter what happens around the world, no matter what happens all around me. Tsunamis of all kinds might happen all around me. Disasters of all kinds might be happening all around me. Yet I will rejoice in the Lord. I will take joy in the God of my salvation. And in Psalm 43, 4, the psalmist says, I will go to the altar of God, to God my exceeding joy, and I will praise you, O God, my God. That is some testimony, ladies and gentlemen. What is so, so bad in your life that the joy that you have is sucked out. Do not let the devil take the joy that you ought to have, no matter what it is. 
you're applying for that school and perhaps it does not work out. Likewise, you're looking for that position and it may not work out. You're looking for that relationship, again, it might not work out. No matter what it is that you're going through in life, nothing should take away that joy. You might have ups and downs, but when you look at your life, you ought to be facing that upward direction. Your entire attitude and your focus ought to be going towards heaven. You might slow down a bit. You might get fatigued a little bit. But by the renewing of the power of the Holy Spirit and by the teaching of his word through your prayer, you ought to regain that joy. When you sing praise, you're rejoicing in the Lord. The mournful, broken hearts rejoice. Your mournful heart is broken because you are rejoicing in the Lord. Isn't that what you do when you praise? You simply lose yourself in the significance of God's glory. Let every soul, let every blind, every dumb, every lame leap for joy because God has given us eternal security. He has given us eternal salvation. Your Savior has come. Let every person rejoice. Let every sick person, let every person who is under the weather, let every person under temptation, let every person who is so lonely and depressed, let every person stand up and praise the Lord, rejoice, because your Savior has come. You should have an endless, exuberant gratitude to the God who gave us true everlasting joy. You ought to have an exuberant, exceeding joy, not just a small, tiny, smirking joy, but an exuberant joy that the world cannot give. And let that be a testimony to the rest of the world. Do we call ourselves children of God? At least we have one child of God. Do you, the rest of you, call yourself a child of God? Corporately, we ought to become salt and light of the world. And one of the marks that the world will be looking at is are Christians happy worshiping the Lord? Are they joyful serving God? Are they happy rejoicing under all circumstances? Are they praising God? The world is watching. The world is making their conclusion and evaluation your being joyful may not lead them to salvation because salvation can only happen when anyone would receive Christ as their Lord and Savior, for there is no other way. Jesus is the only way, truth, and life. No one can go to the Father except through him. But your joyfulness will open their heart at least, and it'll open the, a dialogue, a conversation. It'll be a common ground for any person to approach you when they see you rejoicing in the Lord. That is why Paul the Apostle says, Rejoice, and again I say, Rejoice. Our salvation is permanent. Be thankful. Get up in the morning when nothing happens. I'm just so thankful today that I am saved. It is not something anyone can take away. I am forgiven. I am set free. I am going to be in the presence of God for all eternity. Nothing can take away this, what God has promised. I have the Holy Spirit living in me. I am secured in Christ because God the Father has made his promise. I have peace with God, grace, hope, love, deliverance, and joy. This ought to make you rejoice. Go tonight before you go to bed, thank the Lord and sleep well and thank God for giving you another opportunity for you to perhaps wake up in the morning. You ought to be saying thank you Lord for another opportunity. Do not take life for granted. Do pray for those families of children who have been shot by an individual. Lots of tragedies happening all around this country and around the world. We need to be asking God that he will protect, put a hedge around all of our family, our church, our ministry, that God will receive glory and praise. There are many things we don't understand, but we thank God. May we become people of gratitude. Let us rejoice starting right now. Amen.